God. What a good God. And how worthy of all the glory and the honor. Praise God. Praise God. So good to see you in the Lord's house today. Especially happy to have all of our guests and want you to make yourself right at home. Although I remember the first time I visited a Pentecostal church and it was a, I had a big growth curve to experience. It was a shock. They were staring at me and I was staring at them. But uh, it worked out good. It's been the best decision I ever made in my life. Praise God. Praise God. We're delighted to have um, brother and sister Urshan and their sons, Joseph and Benjamin. Is that right? The tall ones, Joseph, and the short ones, Benjamin. And that helps me a lot. Because that keeps it in biblical alignment. Those of you who name your children out of tribe and out of order make us crazy. Brother Urshan, I want you to come this morning. And we're delighted that you're here. We want you to, whatever the Holy Ghost has planted in your heart, we want you to take your liberty and tell us what the Holy Ghost has said this morning. Praise God. Oh, let's lift our hands and let's love the Lord right now. Let's give God thanks. Let's give God thanks. Let's give God thanks. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. Oh, I feel the presence of the Lord in this place right now. You're so good to us, Jesus. You're so good to us, Jesus. Amen. 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 What a, what a privilege it is to be in the house of the Lord this morning. I have been serving the Lord almost all of my life. And I have come to the conclusion that this is the best life. This is the best life. Living for God is the best life. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And I'm so happy to be with you here uh, in Birmingham slash Trussville, Alabama. And um, it's always a pleasure to be in service with Pastor Sutton, his family, his ministry, and his people. I, um, I believe in patriarchal influence. And I believe that there are men that God has placed in certain regions the political system tries to mimic that by having people vote people in and vote people out. But I, I think God has a better system than that. Amen. And I think he raises up men who, who fulfill his will. And Pastor Sutton is one of those men. Thank you, Jesus. And it's my honor to be here. I thank you for the invitation. And, um, I'm happy that my family can be here with me. I want to bring them with me as much as I can. Um, I want to expose them to people of like precious faith. Praise God. I'm just happy to be in the house of God today. While you're standing, um, I'll have you turn with me to uh, the book of Job chapter 28. And it's good to see uh, friends and acquaintances. Um, I know when we come up here for the Ignite conference we see many familiar faces and we love having the church come and visit with us when we do that and the only ones I'm not happy to see are the basketball team um, I still bear in my body the marks and it's a humbling thing to know you're getting old but but pray for them while they get used to that idea because I'm young I'm I, I'm talking about them I'm not 
No, they humbled us greatly. And um, I thank God for the lesson in humility. Praise God. God does great things. Job chapter 28 and verse 1. If you have it, say amen. <clears throat> Surely there is a vein for the silver and a place for gold where they find it. Not find it, but find it. Iron is taken out of the earth. And brass is molten out of the stone. He setteth an end to darkness, searcheth out all perfection. The stones of darkness, the shadow of death. The flood breaketh out from the inhabitant. Even the water is forgotten of the foot. They are dried up, they are gone away from men. As for the earth, out of it cometh bread, and under it is turned up as it were fire. The stones of it are the place of of sapphires and it hath dust of gold there is a path which no fowl knoweth and which the vulture's eye hath not seen the lion's whelps have not trodden it nor the fierce lion passed by it he putteth forth his hand upon the rock he overturneth the mountain by the roots he cutteth out rivers among the rocks his eye seeth every precious Thing. He bindeth the floods from overflowing. The thing that is hid bringeth he forth to light. But where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Now that's a whole lot of poetic talk right there. And I have wrestled with that scripture oftentimes. But I feel like God has laid something on my heart this morning. I want to share with you. I want to I preach to you. A very simple message I've entitled the place of wisdom and understanding the place of wisdom and understanding amen I believe God has places he wants to take us this morning amen I think God has good things in store for people who will turn over the mountain and and will uproot the rock and look in the low places praise God amen God bless you you can be seated this morning. <clears throat> I sat down at Waffle House this morning. A culinary de delight. Eggs over easy. Hash browns with cheese melted over the sides. Hot coffee. And to keep in sync with my cardiovascular strict regimen, biscuits and gravy to my left. Um, if I have a weakness, it is breakfast. Uh, something about it needs to happen when the sun rises so that my my heart can be right with God. <laughs> I'm not sure that's spiritual, but it's just a, a psychological thing. And I, I, I was praying, I was meditating. Uh, the sun had not risen yet. I, I like to beat the sun up and I like to I like to talk to God before phones start ringing and before uh, stuff starts happening. And um, I was sitting there reading and I'm reading, I'm meditating, I'm consuming. And the waitress walked up to me. And she said, she said, you're a man of God, aren't you? And I said, well, I like to think so. And um, depends on who you ask. <laughs> but I like to think so. And, and she, she said, well, I saw you pray over your food. And, and I... I saw you reading the Bible and she said, you were actually here about a year ago. And that startled me because I was, and I was in that booth and I, the last time I was here preaching and I said, Oh, you might be thinking of somebody else. She said, no, you're from Georgia or something like that. I said, Florida. She said, I remember you cause you look like Clark Kent <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you prayed then too. <laughs> well, okay. You got me. Uh, and so 
I, I was a little startled. I said, now that's a spooky memory. I mean, that's good. Do you remember what I ordered? No, I, I didn't say that. Um, but she said, pray for me, man of God, because this place needs prayer. I need prayer. And she teared up. And I said, I will pray for you. And I said, do you have a pen? And I, I, she said, yeah. And I handed, she handed me a pen. I wrote down, I wrote down the address to the church here and the phone number and Pastor Sutton's name. And she went, Pastor Sutton. And I said, yes. And she said, I know him. I said, you do? I said, he's a man of God. And, and when you need prayer, you go to him in that church. And she said, I do. She said, I'm actually going tonight. So when Monica shows up from Waffle House, hallelujah, God's got good stuff going on. Now, I believe that God does things at times. And I think he does things in places. And I think, I think he has intersections. And I think he has encounters. And I think that God knew before the foundation of the world that a young man would be eating at a Waffle House at 545 in the morning and talking to the woman who was serving the food. And I just believe that. I believe God attends to those kinds of details. I think there's people here in church this morning that you can't define everything that happened in your life and why it happened and how it happened and who did what, when, where, and why. But somehow you got to the house of God and somehow you're here on a Sunday morning and I believe God's big enough and God's strong enough and God knows enough. His ways are so high above our ways and his thoughts. Oh, we serve a God that is able to reach down into your predicament and he orchestrates and he moves and he works on the behalf of people. Ah, oh, hallelujah. He's great today. I'm worshiping like this because he's great. I'm not reserved because there is no reservation to his glory. Somebody make up in your mind to praise him according to his excellent greatness. According to his greatness, that's how we praise him. According to his knowledge, that's how we praise him. And honey, there ain't no limit to what God can do. Hallelujah. Oh, somebody say thank you, Jesus. Amen. Praise God. You can be seated. I... I am amazed by it because it's humbling. It's humbling. I, what I read this morning was in the book of 1 Samuel, and it was David as he dealt with the Philistine king, uh, Achish. And he was talking to him, and, and sometimes I'm just reading the Bible, and as I'm reading the Bible, the story's there, the context is there, but... Oftentimes a phrase will just jump off the page at me. And I learned a long time ago that when you look at the scripture, that the scriptures declare the glory of God. And they teach Jesus. Uh, in the Old Testament, I'm always looking for Jesus. I'm always looking for the pointing finger that points to Calvary. I'm looking at Revelation. I'm looking for hidden things. I think uh, one place he said, open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Uh, it's the kind of thing, uh, re reading in the book uh, of Judges, you know, you can read the story of Samuel, and, and, or rather Samson, and, and as you read the account, you know, you, oh, yeah, there's Delilah, and okay, yeah, foxes, tails tied together, cornfields, Philistines mad, uh, jawbone of a donkey, uh, yeah, we know that, and, and I've read that a, a kabillion times, and, and uh, uh, you know, you can get to the point where you think, well, I, I know everything there is to know in there. I, I think you're in a dangerous spot when you think you know everything there is to know about a thing. And just sitting there one day, I, the phrase jumps off the page that he slew more in his death than in his life. I mean, just the story is there. The context is there. But he slew more in his death than in his life. And right in my mind, Jesus, Jesus. Amen. He did great things. He healed uh, the lame. He opened blinded eyes. But I'm going to tell you, he saved more in his death than in his life. 
he did in his death. They were trying to stop him from his death. He said, I got to die. I got to go because what, you think this is great? The day's coming when you're going to do mightier things. You're going to see greater things. And I've got to shed my blood and I got to pour out my spirit because I'm going to do more in my death than I did in my life. And I'm telling you, sometimes you just got to overturn some things to find what God is trying to say. And so reading Achish looks at David and he says, whither have you made a road today? Whither have you made a road? And so my mind goes to roads and it goes to ways and it goes to paths. It goes to, I mean, these are scriptural terms um, and, and they seem directional. There, there's a direction somebody's going to take today. You're going to choose to go one way or the other. One, one prophet said, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. Therefore, choose life. And he, and, and, and he makes them analogous to ways, roads. Um, one place he said that God leads us in paths of righteousness for his namesake. There is a path of righteousness. It is a, it is a, a footway. It is a road. It is, there is an actual direction to it. You have to make choices to go there. I'm in church on Sunday morning because I want to know the path of righteousness. I like the path of righteousness. I believe righteousness is one of the greatest things that we can attain. Um, I don't just think that it's some kind of an abstract metaphor or vague terminology. I think righteousness is powerful. Amen. I think righteousness is stronger than deceit. I, I, I'll call it what the Bible calls it. It calls it a breastplate. I'm going to tell you what, if you'll get a hold of righteousness, it will protect you. The world says that you got to use protection and they'll, they'll apply it to a lot of different things. I don't want that kind of protection. I want the protection of righteousness. It doesn't fail. It, it doesn't break. It doesn't stop. It doesn't, it, you can't dent it. You can't, there's, there's no breaking down. I mean, it, when, when it's, it's a good thing to know that when blue and red and white lights show up in your rear view mirror, you don't have to break out in a sweat. Because righteousness encapsulates you. You don't have to worry about, did, did I clean the car out? Did I, did I, did I, did I do something? What did I say? How did I, where was I at? What, you don't have to do that because righteousness insulates you. You can, you can confidently say, is everything all right, officer? Because I haven't done a thing wrong. And righteousness is a breastplate that covers you. You don't have to worry about things that the world has to worry about. Because paths of righteousness, breastplates of righteousness will keep your marriage together. Will keep your family together. We'll help raise your children. We'll put you on a firm foundation. Oh, glory to God. I'm trying to tell somebody that there is a way. There is a path. There is a I'm here on a Sunday morning to lift him up and I want his righteousness. I want him to baptize me with righteousness. I want him to order my steps in his word. Ah, the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. <laughs> you can be seated. I, <laughs> oh, they, they, you know, living for God is so much better than living for the world. People say, well, I don't want to live for God and I need some excitement in my life. That's just folks that have never had any pain. Another word for boredom. When you're a teenager, you retranslate that when you get about 30 and you call it peace. <laughs> and that word excitement that you're looking for, it, you retranslate that into chaos. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you have enough court dates. You have enough illegitimate children. You have enough uh, doctor's visits that are unplanned. You have enough people banging on your door at three in the morning. You got enough drug dealers chasing you down. And all of a sudden the excitement, it, where, where's thin? You'll have more excitement than you know what to do with. 
Righteousness protects me from all of those things. I'm making up in my mind. I'm staying in the house of God. I'm going to church on Sunday morning and I like what happens so much. I'm going back on Sunday night. This is the way. Walk therein. This is the paths that you follow. Don't forget about it. Search diligently for it. Ah, I'm talking about his ways because his ways are above our ways and his thoughts are above our thoughts and you're not going to find it. Amen. I, I, let me say it this way. You're not going to find it by natural means. Well, I, you know, the way I see it, no, nobody cares about how I see it. I need to know how God sees it. One place said, it is not in man to know right. It, it doesn't exist inside of me. So natural means are not going to bring about God's will. So there is a path that the fowl's eye has never seen. And the lion has never walked upon and the fierce lion has never gone by it. That's another way of saying you're not going to naturally come to these conclusions. It requires supernatural intervention. It requires God grabbing a hold of somebody and saying, this is the way. Walk ye therein. Amen. It, I just need somebody that will seek for it. I'll, I just need somebody that will search for it. Um. When, when, when Job talks about it, what he says is, he says, there's a vein for silver and there's a place for gold. And he, he describes metallurgy. He describes pulling precious metals from the ground. And it is a way. It is a vein of gold. It's the kind of thing. And what he is describing is mining. The picture is of going underground. The picture is going beneath the surface. Oh, hallelujah. I, 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 I don't want to stay on the surface of life. I think, you know, the, the scholars say that we use 10% of our brain. They say that a small fraction of our brain is, is in use at any given time. And they also say that by the time you're three years of age, you have learned more than you'll learn the rest of your life. In terms of motor skills, in terms of dexterity, in terms of language, in terms of uh, how to communicate and, and make sense out of the world. By three years of age, you have learned 75% of everything you're ever going to learn. And it's like things shut down. It's like there's this whole other section of our life that we never tap into. And I believe God wants to wake that stuff up inside of us. I believe we're operating at a diminished capacity. And it's the kind of a thing that when you sit down in a restaurant at 545 in the morning. That God starts sparking things. Things that you should know but you don't know. And the only way to know is to be praying. And to be calling on God and saying God show me, lead me, die. I can't see this. I don't know where it's at. We lost it when Adam and Eve fell. But I know there's something out there that you're doing. So wake up portions of and the cognizant, ra rational, logical side of my mind is trying to eat breakfast. But God's got paths intersecting and God's got supernatural stuff happening and God's got somebody that needs the Holy Ghost and God's got there's devils flying around and God's got angels walking in and they're trying to beat up on a little girl so he sends a man of God I believe that happens I was I was walking I, I, I walk sometimes when I pray I get away from the stuff and I go down by the water where I live and I was walking, and as I was walking, I saw a man out on a pier. And I walked out to the pier, and I looked at the water, saw a man fishing over to the side. It was midday. And as I looked at him fishing, the Holy Ghost came on me. And it was one of those things where, you know, people are going to think you're crazy if you do what you feel like you need to do. And so I shrugged it off. <laughs> And I said, ah, you know what? That's not anything. I mean, but it felt like I was going to speak in tongues. And I, 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 I wrestled with it. And I looked at the water. And I prayed. And I wrestled with it. And I kept turning my attention back to him. And finally, after about five minutes of fighting with God, I said, hey, how you doing? 
great weather, huh? This is my, my apostolic inserting myself here. This was a mighty... <laughs> I'm trying to find a way to get a handle on what I'm feeling. I'm talking about the weather and the sunshine. And, and he says, I'm doing good. And we talked. We talked about fishing. And I don't want to talk about fishing. I want to talk to him about the Holy Ghost. And, and, we, and, and we talked a little bit about it. And, and he was a kind man. And, and, and finally, you know, um, I walked away. And I talked, having talked about fishing. And I walked down the pier. And I headed back to my car. And, I mean, I got 100 feet away. And the Holy Ghost smote me. And, and, and everything logical and rational inside of me said, you can't do that. People don't do that in 2013. And another side was sparking and saying, you go back and you tell that man he needs to repent of his sins, be baptized in Jesus' name, and be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. I have put you in a place for a purpose. And I'm wrestling. The spiritual and the natural are wrestling inside of me as God wants to take me down into a path that, that the, the foul's eye hasn't seen. And I... I stopped and I said, okay, if they lock me up, they lock me up. Here we go. Then I walked back up the pier and I said, sir, this may sound crazy, but God told me to tell you everything's going to be all right. And he looked at me and we just looked at each other. <laughs> and he said, are you a man of God? And I said, yes, I'm a man of God. He said, I knew there was something about you. Tell me, man of God, what God has told you. And I said, God told me to tell you that you are to repent of your sins and to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of those sins. And God will fill you with the Holy Ghost. And what you're wrestling with, he'll take care of it. We got a Bible study when I get back from Birmingham. We got a Bible study set up. And, and he broke down in tears. And he said, I didn't have my, my wits in. I was at the end of my rope. And I'm telling you, God sends people. God sends people. God puts people in situations but you've got to be looking for the path you've got to be looking for the way you've got to let the spirit of God you're going to think you're crazy you're going to think you lost your mind but I'm telling you that there is a path <laughs> and we always were supposed to walk it you can be seated I'm amazed at the the phrasing that he uses Job tries to describe it. He says, the earth brings forth bread and, and people live in it on the surface. And they live their lives. They plant crops. They do stuff. That, that's, that's life. But underneath that, there's a whole other thing going on. There's a whole other world going on. And, 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 and he, he describes that world. He describes another kind of path. Now, the, the vulture, the fowl, the lion, they can find the paths of men that they've carved, but they can't find the underground path. And he said, that's kind of what it's like with wisdom and understanding. It's kind of like that. Man searches it out to find that which is perfect. To find, he overturneth rocks. He uprooteth mountains he 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 binds up waters so that they don't flow and meaning literally he dams up areas so that he can access what's underneath that ground i'm going to tell you that there there should be nothing that stops you from seeking the things of god if you will make up in your mind that i am going to serve god i am going to search out the things of god i'm going to look into the word of god I, I don't, I, 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 this is one of the reasons why I cannot get involved in Hollywood. The plastic worlds that the devil erects for people to get lost in. I don't have time to get lost in there because there is a path that goes a lot deeper than that. And God is talking to my mind and is speaking to my mind. And I don't need to turn on Hollywood. I just need to open up the word of God. And it's deeper than the words. It's deeper than the, the literature and the text. God will take you somewhere in the Holy Ghost and he'll show you. Oh, somebody listen to me. God will help you confront the devils that have bound your family. 
I'm talking about generational devils that held your grandfather and held your father and, and held, held you. And he wants to break those curses off of your family. He wants to liberate you and liberate your children. He wants to set the captive free. But you can't do it in these paths. You got to go a little deeper. You got to get under the crust. You got to get beneath the surface. This is why he looks at Peter and he says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood has not revealed this unto thee, but my father, which is in heaven. You keep on that track, Peter, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And up, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You can't do it on the top path. You got to go deep to get that. The revelation of the mighty God in Christ comes from two people that will uproot mountains and will dam up waters. You can be seated. <laughs> this is, it's a place. It's an area. It's a location where wisdom and understanding dwell. Where is the place thereof? Uh, it's, it's a continual pursuit and a searching out. I, 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 sometimes, I think one of the greatest things you can do is just immerse yourself in the word of God. I, I think it's a good idea to pray. And, and pray before you read. There's something about praying before I read that unlocks things. It breaks up the fallow ground. So that when I take in the word of God, stuff starts popping. I want to spend that hour. I want to spend, sometimes I get lost in two hours, three hours. I get lost. It. People say, have you lost your mind? Uh-uh, there's just a path you don't know about. I think in immersion, things happen. I mean, in being immersed in the word of God, people say, well, how did you find that out? What, what, did, what did you, oh, you're, that's great. Oh, I want to be great. You don't have to worry about being great. Just immerse yourself in the things of God. Immerse yourself in the word of God. When you start doing that, all of a sudden, he starts talking to you. If you take a rock and you put it under water and you leave it there long enough, you'll come back in about six months and there'll be stuff growing on it. Because there's just stuff in there. There's, there's spores and there's, there's plantings and there's things that attach. And I'm going to tell you that you'll just be going through and immersing yourself in the things of God and stuff will just start happening around you just because you're immersed in it. I, I've sat in my chair at home and, and I've just felt thoughts come to me. I'm not saying God talks to me. I'm not trying to say that God just audibly speaks every other day. I'm telling you that it's like my thoughts get directed. It's like I start thinking things. God will direct the thoughts of people that immerse themselves in his purpose. And he does talk. God does talk. God can wake you up in the middle of the night with something that you don't even know where it came from. It came from God and it comes from people immersing themselves in the purpose of God as he takes you down paths that we, that you didn't know about. I, I was sitting there in my, my lazy boy one day, and I, I was reading uh, in the Genesis, the latter part of Genesis, where, where God was giving out the blessings and, and the futures of the sons of Israel. And one of the sons, uh, he talked to Gad. And just a little snippet that's in there, Gad, uh, a troop shall overcome him, but in the end he shall prevail. And, and, and just, just thrown in there, I didn't know what it meant. And, and I'm just sitting there and... And something about Gad just kept nibbling at the edges of my mind. I'm talking about being immersed in the word of God. I'm talking about pathways opening up. And I'm talking about God. Find, this, the Bible says this is the place of sapphires. And this is the place of gold. There are things in the word of God that will strengthen you, that will edify you, that will bring hidden things to light. And so I, a troop shall overcome him. A troop shall overcome him. In the end, he shall prevail. And I, I was ready to file it away, but God just took my mind and yanked it over to the demoniac who is there. Uh, he he's, he's, he's can't be bound. And, and, and the Bible says they tried to put chains on him. And, and he plucked them asunder. If anybody's ever been bound, you know what I'm talking about. You can try to chain up your actions, but it's a lot more than your behavior. You've got to change the heart of a man. You got to change the heart of a woman. You got to get down on the inside and you can chain all this stuff up out here. But if you're not set free on the inside, it's not going to work. And this man was bound. The more bound you are, the more crazy you'll get. And, 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 and the knowledge came out that, that his name was Legion. 
because, because uh, they, there were many, and people say there were thousands of devils inside of that man. And it took me a minute to recognize what I was looking at. But then when I found that he was from the country of the Gadarenes, it started to make a little more sense as I realized that a troop had overcome him. And, and now when I look at the scriptures and I see this man from Gad and he's in the country of Gad and a troop has overcome him. I don't believe that God put that account in the scripture by accident. I believe that he put it in there on purpose that a troop shall overcome him. But the day is going to come when a Messiah is going to step out of a boat and he's going to have dominion over all of the legions and all of the devils and all of the forces of hell. The Bible calls him the head of all principalities and powers and at the name of Jesus every he shall bow and every tongue shall confess and there is no troop and there is no host the bible says if a host encamp against me in this will i be confident i know that my god can overcome all of those things and though a troop come against you god knows how to set you free i don't care how many devils you got floating around in your head i don't care how many things that you've allowed in god knows how to cause you to prevail Hope comes to people that will immerse themselves in the word of God. God has things in store for people that will search out his will and his purpose. There are paths that our forefathers walked that we need to walk. There are things my forefathers knew that I need to know. I, I, it amuses me when I look at young people because most young people think that it all starts with them. <laughs> and mom and dad don't know anything. If I could have just stopped the world when I was 16 and I knew everything, everything would have been great. <laughs> got a little older and the older I got, the smarter my parents got. <laughs> As I realized that it's not that mom and dad didn't know. They knew they'd been there and they had discarded it. And I'm, I'm wading through the molasses. I'm trying to fight my way through a jungle when a path was already blazed. I'm going to tell you that obedience is a, is a, is a shortcut to blessing. I don't want to learn things the hard way. I don't want to go through those things. I don't want to mess around and mess up my life. I want to obey the voice of God. I want to obey my parents in the Lord that my, my days may be long on the earth. I, I don't just consult with my pastor. I obey my pastor because there are things he has seen. There are places he's been and I don't want to learn the hard way. I don't want to try to blaze another path. When better men than me have already blazed it. Whither have you made a way today, David? You can be seated. We're making a way every day. We are forging ahead. We are blazing a path. We are cutting a swath. We are dynamiting. We're changing the topography of our lives every single day. Day. Where you go after this service will determine which way you go. What you allow your mind, what I allow my mind to dwell upon will change the course of what I do and how I feel. I believe that we need to have faith. The simple act of having faith will make things better. And if it's a directional kind of thing, because the Bible says we walk by faith. Amen. If you're sitting here believing it's the end and you're dragging down your whole family with your countenance and your tone of voice and your negativity and all you can see is the negative. I believe that that is the equivalent of walking down a dark pathway. Amen. That's walking down a road of negativity. Your body will respond to that. The chemicals of your mind, the serotonin that's released, there's stuff going on in your heart as, as stress chemicals are killing you slowly. Your, your children are learning how to be negative and, and families are learning how to be negative. I believe that faith is a powerful thing and, and, and something as simple as the lift of your eyebrows and something as simple as the tone of your voice that says this is the day that the Lord has made and we will... Re 
we will means I got power over it. I, I could do a lot of things, but I made up in my mind. I will praise. I will go to church. I will clap my hands. I will force my will. I can do it. I can leap for joy. I can dance before God. I can believe God. I will worship him. I will be involved. I will have purpose. It's a decision that I can make. Praise God. You can be seated. I, I, I read about paths, and the Bible tells us to, it tells us that when John showed up, that he would straighten out the crooked. And he said he would make a highway for the Lord. I want an expressway. I don't want a back alley. And I, I think they start out as paths. The Bible described them as paths of righteousness. But by the time we get to John, it's a highway of holiness. In the old days, it started as a, out as a cow trail. There'd be places. Corinth was one of those places. There were places in ancient, the ancient world where, where people would congregate because there was water there. There were ports there. And there were ways. And they started out as trails. A guy would walk it to where, to where the grass bent. And another guy would walk it. And enough people walk it. And it becomes a little sliver of a path. And it's one of the reasons why, uh, why the Bible describes the pathway to hell as being broad. And many there be which go in there at. Because there's a lot of feet walking down that path. So it's a broad path. And the way to life is narrow. And few there be that find it. Because not as many people are going to walk on that path. Uh, but, but it starts out as a path, and, and, and it grows into something better and something stronger. And, 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 and eventually one day somebody realizes we have to express lane this thing. we got to get rid of the congestion. we got to get rid of the stoplights. we got to overpass this because we got to get from point A to point B. I want to build a highway for the Lord. There are architects that, that calculate water flow and they, they calculate drainage and they calculate cars and, and, and the weight and the, the width of the road. And, and when they finally get to that point, you have an expressway that costs billions of dollars. So you commerce can continue to happen in life can continue to go on. And if they can do that for the shopping market down the way, surely I can do it for the greatest thing that this world has ever seen. I want an expressway to the Lord. I don't want a casual encounter with God. I don't want a simple little cow trail leading to church. I want it known in my life that this is an expressway. On Sunday morning, we will go to the house of God. And we're coming back on Sunday night. It's so good. And there's a midweek service and there's a prayer meeting. And this thing is a high Way. This thing is an expressway from point A to point B. And I want to get into his presence as fast as I can. I want to get there. I want to worship him. I don't want the distractions. <laughs> so there is a way. There is a way. You can be seated. Uh, I actually think that we got to be willing to do what's necessary to go that way. Uh, Elisha looked at Elijah and he said, I want a double portion of what you have. And Elijah looked at him and he said, okay, stay here while I go to Bethel. They were in Gilgal. Stay here. Stay here. Uh, and Elisha looked at him and said, as the Lord liveth. I will go with you. I will not stay here. I believe that there are opportunities to stay. And I believe there's opportunities to not go. I think if we allow the habitual and the comfortable. And we allow the finite and the logical and the rational to dictate our lives. We will stay there. They started out in Gilgal. Now this place is God will take you. And I'm talking about the way of wisdom and understanding. I want to know his ways. I want revival. I want my family to be blessed. I want the blessing of God exploding in my family. The Bible says that they started out in Gilgal. And, and I think there's places that you'll start out with God. And 
Elijah actually looked at him and says, man, you asked a hard thing. And when you think about the hard thing he asked, you ask yourself, well, who is it hard for? Because the one place in the Bible says, is there anything too hard for God? And there's nothing too hard for God. So the hard thing is not, it's not hard for God. And is it hard for Elijah? No, it's not hard for Elijah. Elijah's got it. Elijah's calling fire down from heaven. Elijah's raising the dead. Elijah's getting ready to be carried away in a chariot of fire. He's got it. He's the one being inquired of. So it's not hard for Elijah. So who's it hard for? The only person left in this equation is Elisha. As you realize that you, you got to do some stuff to find this pathway. You, you have to do this, some stuff to, to get to this location. It doesn't come to the casual observer. It doesn't come to the weekend warrior. It doesn't come to the easily persuaded. It doesn't come to the easily offended. Hallelujah. Gilgal. What's Gilgal? Well, the Bible says that at Gilgal, that's the place where they set up the stones. They set up the 12 stones. That said, this is the way we came out of Egypt. I think one of the first things you're going to have to get is you're going to have to get in concrete how you come out. I'm amazed at the pathway of the Lord because it takes revelation. Uh, Anybody here ever get lost with your GPS? Am I I the only one? We went to a place in the mountains the other day in Gatlinburg and I had the GPS. And be very careful of GPS and mountains. You'll end up in some weird place. Where strange people live. (laughs) And the GPS said that this was the place. And I looked around. This is not the place. (laughs) I, I, I realized that I was in a strange place and the GPS had lied to me. The FedEx guy came pulling up behind me and, and he's, we got a topper on top of our car. You know, we do not look like people from the area he sees florida plates and he stops behind me and he rolls his window down and he says gps lied to you huh (laughs) (laughs) yes yes my good friend (laughs) there are things in this life that can lead you astray but god's word doesn't lead you astray sometimes god will lead to what you think is a dead end god will lead you to a place where you have no idea why he brought you there and everything logical inside of you says why i have lost my mind he'll give you a reason to stop he'll give you a dead end he'll give you a reason to stay here and go no further he'll he'll bring you to the edge of an ocean and tell you that this is where we're going and you're looking out there with the holy ghost gps looking at waves And the tendency is to murmur and the tendency is to complain and people start looking around for rocks to throw at Moses. And, 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 and the Bible says that there was a pathway the whole time. You can't see that pathway. It requires God parting the Red Sea. It it requires revelation to reveal. It requires, it's under the surface, but man, if you'll stay there long enough and you'll let the Holy Ghost move and you'll let the church do what it does, God will pull things away so the hidden can be revealed and the path was always there. You just didn't know it. The path was always in location. You just had to stay long enough to let faith work. And so God said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. You couldn't see the salvation of God until you could stand still long enough for God to work. I'm never going to find a husband if I serve God. I got to go out and do my thing. No, that's what got you in this mess. Stand still, honey, and let God work on you. Oh, I'm never going to find a wife. I got to go out to a club. No, you don't got to go to a club. You need to stay in church and let God change and refine. And Abraham looks at Sarah and says, there's no hope. Yes, there is hope. It looks like a dead end. It's not a dead end. You got to stay there and let God's promises come to pass. Because there is a way. There is a way. There is a way that the fowl has never seen. The vulture's eye has never looked upon. The lion has never seen it. You can be seated. The predator. (laughs) Some people think that holiness is the wrong way. 
They think holiness is a dead end. No, 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 I've got I to do my thing. I've got to show out. Some people took that scripture, we bring the sacrifice of praise, and they mistook it for we bling the sacrifice of praise. <laughs> That's my bad jokes. I'm sorry, folks. <laughs> I believe holiness is a protection. I believe it protects purity. I believe that it keeps innocence. And I think that's beautiful. Oh, well, 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 they're never going to notice me. That's right, because the predator doesn't see this. So underneath the camouflage of holiness, you're protected. The predator walks right by. Now he'll notice the bright plumage. The hunter will notice the huge antlers. The hunter will notice the brightly colored. But holiness protects. Now underneath this covering, there's great beauty. There's something precious. But it's only for a husband. It's only for a wife. It's not for the predators of the world. See, the lion walks right by this path. It's, it's not a dead end. It's just a protected pathway. So this is the way. Walk in it. You will have a better marriage if you understand holiness. Your children will grow up intact if you understand holiness. You will, you will walk past snares that the, that the fowler has laid if you understand holiness. Because there is a way. And the lion can't find it. Job tries to describe it. Elijah tells Elisha, we got to go to a place. I'm, I'm trying to come to a close. I'm going to wrap up. But I think that if you're going to find this, God's will and God's purpose, you're going to have to go to some places. I think one of those places will be Gilgal. I think you got to get salvation firmly planted in your life. I don't want to be wishy-washy on how I got out. I want to know what brings people out. He set up stones so that when your children grow a little older, they'll know this is the way. It's not another way. This is the way. I am here today preaching the apostolic message because my father set up some stones and he refused to remove the ancient landmark. And my grandfather set up some stones and my great grandfather, there were some waters that parted and he knew that generations would come that wouldn't see it and that didn't see the miracles and that never saw the bread and that never saw uh, uh, the different miracles coming out of Egypt. And so they set up stones so that, that we wouldn't know how they got out. And that happened at Gilgal. And I think we have to know what happens in that type of a setting. I need to get the apostolic message firmly in my heart. If I'm going to stay on the way, it breaks my heart watching people leave the way because they don't even know the fundamental things of God. So praying is non-negotiable. It's a stone set up in my, it's not something that you do when you get around to it. It's not something you find time for. It's not an optional thing. I've got to pray. I, 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 I've got to build my life around prayer. My, my schedule doesn't interrupt prayer. I can't let that happen. I, I've got to build my life around prayer. I don't do my schedule and then pray. I pray and build my schedule around that. The reading of God's word, the understanding of the doctrine. This is a place that if you'll get it, you'll get to Gilgal. Then you can move on to the next spot along the way. I want a double portion. I want wisdom. I want understanding. And so wait here. If, and and if, you, if you allow yourself to be talked into waiting here, you'll never get to Bethel. Yeah. Bethel was the house of God. I like what I feel here right now. I can tell this is a house of God. I pastor in Fort Myers, Florida. I'm all the way in Birmingham. And the same Holy Ghost that's there is here. 
They're, they're having church right. They're an hour behind us there. And my church starts an hour later than yours. So we're having church at the exact same time right now. My, one of my young ministers is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ right now as we speak. And the same Holy Ghost that's down there is up here right now. And there's a Bethel revelation where you realize this is the place where Jacob saw the ladder. This is the place where heaven meets earth. This is the way where the way is manifest. He looked at him and said, I'm going to give you a way out of this place. You're going to climb up and there's angels going to be going up and coming down. I believe in that. I believe that when we come to church, Bethel, the house of God, that's what Bethel means, house of God. When, when we come to church, I believe that we go up. Amen. And I hate it that I got to come back down, but I got to go work a job tomorrow and I got to show up and punch a clock. But midweek service, I get to go up again at Bethel. And when I come back down, I got to come back down and pay utility bills and I got to mow the grass. But Sunday morning is coming and I get to go back up again because this is Bethel. This is Bethel. This is the place where God dwells. This is the place where you can come up out of this nasty world for a little while and you can get up. The Bible says he made us to sit together in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. I made up my mind. I'm going to church. I'm going to church. I'm going to church. I dress up my children. Come on, honey. You're going to church. Sometimes you don't even know what's going on. You just got to know I got to get to Bethel. I got to get to the house of God. All right, give me two more minutes. I'm closing, I promise. You can be seated. There have been times where I literally did not know how to get out of a situation, and I literally just knew one thing, go to church. And preaching pulled me out. God anoints a man to speak things into my ears that he could not know. He, he allows testimonies to take place that they could not know, but God knows. And it happens at Bethel. And when I get a revelation that I got to get to the house of God and I got to make my house a house of God. And, and I, I, I have a sanctuary. and I want his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And now I have, I, and I've got that. I'm there. I'm there with you, pastor. I got a revelation of the house of God. He looked at him and said, all right, now you're going to have to come to Jericho. I'm going to head on to Jericho. You wait here. God will let you stay right where you're at. God will let you keep on flipping through scriptures with no understanding if you do it casually. He's looking. The Bible says he's not a rewarder of them that casually seek him. He's not a rewarder of them that temporarily seek him. He's not a rewarder of them that seek him when they're in jail. We got some apostles coming out of jail, reading the Bible all day long, get out of jail, never going to read the Bible again. He's not a rewarder of the people that will seek him on the weekends or Easter on Christmas, but he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. The diligent search, the diligent. You, you, you got to dam up some things. You've got to, you've got to close off some waterways. You got if, if, if there's a shaft to sink to find the precious gold and silver, then they dam up the river and they sink the shaft because there is a way. So he went to Jericho and that young man said, as the Lord liveth, where you go, I go. <laughs> and he went with him to Jericho. I think that once you get a revelation... Of the house of God, you got to get a revelation of victory. Walls got to come down. It's no good to sit in church while you still have strongholds going on. I'm not coming to church just for the goosebumps. I'm coming to church so that strongholds can come down. I plan on going a little further with the man of God. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I plan on alcoholism being broken. I plan on pornography being broken. I plan on addiction being broken. I plan on hatred and bitterness about the past and 
molestation. I plan on those walls falling down. I plan on cynicism and skepticism. I, I think there's some people that need to march around the walls and say, I came this far and I'm not going back. These walls are coming down. They're coming down. They're coming down. I think there's some families that need to grab their children and say, we're going to have a Jericho experience. These walls got to come down. They got to come down. It's along the way. It's along the path. And I'm not staying at Bethel. I'm going to move on into a place. Yeah, I'm going to raise my hands. I'm going to shout. I'm going to glorify God. The shouters are the people that know that when you shout, the walls come down. The, the praisers are the ones that got a revelation that when you shout, the walls come down. This is what it takes to go along the way. You can remain standing. Stand with me this morning. I'm, I'm trying to describe the way where wisdom and understanding live. It is a spiritual dynamic, but there's places in God that I'll go. And I, I have to persevere to get there. I have to hang on to get there. I have to follow my Elijah to get there. And I want a double portion of what God's doing. I looked it up and I, I, I didn't dig too deep into it, but I just looked it up very quickly. He said, I want a double portion. And, 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 and scholars tell you that 14 miracles happened in Elijah's life. And if you count up the prophecies and the miracles that exactly 28 happened in Elisha's. I thought you got to be kidding me. Somebody's got to make up in your mind. I'm going to get this thing. I'm going to get this thing. And, and actually it was 27 when he died. 27. <laughs> hey, I want a double portion. And so we got to 1.999997. <laughs> he got right to the 99th percentile and he died at the 27th miracle. And scripture says that they laid him in a grave. And one day, an army marching by threw in a servant who was dead into an empty tomb. And there was one miracle left. <laughs> and when he hit the bones of the prophet, wow! Number 28 popped out. Make up in your mind, I'm not going to stop until I get his purpose. I'm not going to stop until my family's saved. I'm not going to stop until my children are saved. I'm not going to stop until the walls come down. I'm not going to stop until I have victory in the Holy Ghost. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to stop. I'm going to keep on praying. I'm going to keep on reading. I'm going to keep on worshiping. I'm going to keep on glorifying. Oh, somebody lift your hands and worship with me this morning. Step out of your seat. Step out of your seat. Somebody make your way. Come on down to the front. Ah, help me lift him up today. Hallelujah. Somebody help me lift him up today. Right where you're at, lift up your hands. Lift up your voice. Lift up your heart. Open now mine eyes, Jesus. Open now mine eyes, Jesus. Show me Jesus. Hallelujah. There's some stuff you have in store. I don't know how you're going to do it. I'm standing in front of the Red Sea. But I believe, I believe, I believe there's a path under here. I'm standing in front of a barren womb. But I believe that there's a promise that's going to come out of this. And Oh, somebody lift up your voice. Lift up your voice. Lift up your hands. Yeah, 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 yeah. Somebody turn over the mountain. Somebody uproot the mountain. Somebody rearrange some things I gotta find the place where wisdom dwells I gotta find the place of understanding that's why he said it that's why my pastor does that that's why the church does that Somebody call on his name right now. 
Bible symbols, symbolic objects, the rainbow, a symbol of God's covenant, a stairway, a symbol of the way to God. Thunder, lightning, clouds, and smoke, symbols of God's majesty. Thunder, a symbol of God's voice. Trumpets, a symbol of God speaking. The pillar of cloud and fire, a symbol of guidance. A throne. A symbol of God's glory. Dry bones. A symbol of spiritual death. White hair. A symbol of wisdom. The wind. A symbol of the Holy Spirit. Fire. A symbol of the Holy Spirit. stars and lampstands, symbols of God's ministers. A signet ring, a symbol of authority. Arrows, symbols of God's judgments. A scepter, a symbol of God's rule. The capstone, a symbol of preeminence. A rock, a symbol of stability. The human body, a symbol of interdependence. Grass, a symbol of human frailty. Symbolic creatures, the serpent, a symbol of Satan's subtlety. Locus, a symbol of God's judgment. Beast, symbols of earthly kingdoms. A dove, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. A lamb, a symbol of Jesus Christ's sacrifice. Symbolic actions, breaking a jar, a symbol of the destruction of Jerusalem. The cursing of a fig tree, a symbol of judgment. Washing hands, a symbol of innocence. Being thirsty, a symbol of spiritual need. Baptism, used for salvation, and a symbol of cleansing. The Lord's Supper, a symbol of union with Christ. Anointing, a symbol of empowering by God's Spirit. Harvesting, a symbol of judgment day. Tearing garments, a symbol of anger and sorrow. Spitting, a symbol of contempt. Shaking off dust, a symbol of rejection. Sitting in sackcloth and ashes, a symbol of repentance. Lifting of hands, a symbol of prayer. Covering the head, a symbol of submission. Symbols expressing God's nature and character, God's face, a symbol of His presence. God's arm or hand, a symbol of His power. God's eye, a symbol of His awareness. God's ear, a symbol of God's listening. God bless you. Thanks for watching. Our God, a firm foundation.
Revolution. 